So this video is a general overview of the basic ideas in light and optics. So electromagnetic waves are produced by accelerating charges and travel in space with a speed of light equal to 3 times 10 to the power 8 meter per second. There are different types of electromagnetic waves, all differing in frequency and wavelength, from low frequency to high frequency. And since the energy of an electromagnetic wave is related to its frequency, then this is the direction of increasing energy. Different types include radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. So in general, the speed of a wave is related to its frequency and wavelength through this relation. And in vacuum, V is equal to C. So when an electric charge accelerates, for example, if this charge is oscillating, it will generate a changing electric field, which will generate a changing magnetic field, which in turn will generate a changing electric field, and so forth as they keep regenerating each other and produce an electromagnetic wave. So as you can see, the electric and magnetic field vector vectors are perpendicular to each other and to the direction of propagation of the wave. So the direction of polarization in an electromagnetic wave is defined to be in the direction at which E is vibrating. So for this wave, the direction of polarization is along the y direction. So this represents a linearly polarized light, where the electric field is vibrating along a certain direction. Other types are circular and elliptical polarized light, where it depends on the path that E is tracing while the electromagnetic field is propagating. So a polarized light such as this one can be obtained from unpolarized light by removing all of the electric field vector components except one that lies in a certain single plane. So unpolarized light such as this one is the light that is emitted for example by the sun, a normal light bulb or a candle flame. And this is because the atoms producing such light are all vibrating in different directions. So an atom emitting an electromagnetic wave can be considered like an oscillating dipole. The direction of this oscillating dipole determines the polarization of the emitted wave. And in a normal light bulb, for example, the atoms are vibrating in different directions and they emit unpolarized light. So polarized light is obtained when unpolarized light passes through a polarizer made from a material known as a polaroid and this material has selective absorption where it only absorbs light waves with a certain polarization direction and then emit light waves also with a certain polarization direction. So geometric optics shows the behavior of visible light at the interface between two media and such behavior can be applied to all electromagnetic radiation and this can be done using a simplification model known as the ray model. In this model a ray of light is a straight line along the direction of propagation of the wave. So as you can see a set of light waves are represented by straight arrows and these are the wavefronts. For a plane wave, the wavefront is perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave, which is the direction of the ray. So this ray approximation does not depend on fully incorporating the wave nature of light, other than using the fact that the propagation of the wave is along a straight line. But there is a limit at which this ray approximation can be applied. So let's suppose a plane wave passes through an opening of size d. If d is large compared to the wavelength, then the individual waves emerging from the opening will continue to move in a straight line. And so in this case where the opening is much larger than the wavelength, the ray approximation is still valid. But if the size of the opening gets smaller and is of the order of the wavelength, then the waves and the corresponding rays will spread out in all directions. And this is known as diffraction. And as you can see, diffraction is stronger as the opening gets smaller relative to the wavelength. So if the opening is much smaller than the wavelength, then this opening can be approximated as a point source of waves. But the ray approximation is very good in studying mirrors, lenses, prisms, and other optical instruments such as telescopes and cameras. So now suppose a light ray is traveling in air and is incident at an angle to the normal at a smooth surface. Then experiments show that the reflected ray and the incident ray all lie in the same plane. And it also shows that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, both measured relative to the normal. 
So a perfectly reflecting mirror is not transparent but is made of a thin layer of metal. So now let's suppose that the light ray is traveling in a transparent medium such as air and is obliquely incident at the boundary with another transparent media such as glass. So part of the ray will be reflected and the remaining part is transmitted into the other media. And this transmitted ray experiences a change in direction at the boundary and is said to be refracted. So experiments show that the incident ray, the reflected ray and the refracted ray all lie in the same plane. And it also shows that the angle of refraction theta 2 depends on the properties of the two media and on the angle of incidence through the relationship. Sine theta 2 over sine theta 1 is equal to V2 over V1. So V1 is the speed of light in medium 1 and V2 is the speed in medium 2. So as you can see when light moves from air to glass where its speed is reduced as it enters the glass, then light would be refracted towards the normal. But if the ray moves from glass to air, then it is refracted away from the normal. So the reason why light slows down in glass is the absorption and re-emission of light by the atoms of the glass as the light propagates. And the details of this process can be best explained by quantum physics or also using the classical oscillator model of the atom where the atoms are considered as oscillating dipoles. So the result of this absorption and re-emission of light as it enters into another transparent medium is that light slows down in the denser medium and this slowing down is the reason for refraction. And the index of refraction of a certain medium is defined as C over V, where C is the speed of light in vacuum and V is the speed of light in the medium. So for air or vacuum, n is equal to 1, and for glass, n is equal to 1.5. And note here that as the wave travels from one medium to the other, its frequency does not change because the speed of the wave is related to frequency and wavelength through this relation. And because both the wavelength and the speed changes as the wave travels from one medium to the other, then the frequency of the wave will remain the same. And because as mentioned before, the energy of the wave is related to its frequency, then the energy of the wave does not change as it travels from one medium to the next. And this means that a blue light will remain blue as it travels from air to glass and the red light will remain red. And using this index of refraction equation, you can show that n1 sine theta1 is equal to n2 sine theta2, where n1 is the index of refraction of medium 1, and n2 is the index of refraction of medium 2. And this is known as Snell's law. And note that other waves such as sound waves or seismic waves also experience refraction, so Snell's law is a model for a wave under refraction. So refraction is the reason why an object underwater is seen to be at a different depth than its actual depth. So when light from the fish reaches the surface, it is refracted. And the extension of these refracted rays creates an image here, which is at a different depth than the actual depth. So geometric optics uses the ray approximation in addition to the laws of reflection and refraction and applying geometry and simple trigonometry to find the location, magnification and orientation of an image I produced by a point source of light representing the object O. So this is a flat normal mirror. The image is at the same distance from the mirror as the object and it is upright and not magnified. And this is a concave and convex mirror and there are converging and diverging lenses. So for example, this mirror is like a makeup or shaving mirror where if the object is placed at a distance less than the focal point, then the image formed is magnified and upright. And this is an example of a mirror placed in stores in high positions, where it can cover a large field of view of the store and produce a small image that is upright. So wave optics discusses the interference and diffraction of light. And these two phenomena cannot be explained using the ray approximation, but they require including the full wave nature of light. So in order to produce a stable interference pattern such as this one between two waves, they must maintain a constant phase relationship with one another. And this is known as coherence. And the waves are said to be coherent with each other. Otherwise, if the phase between the two waves is not constant with time, then they are said to be incoherent. 
So a common way to produce two coherent light sources is to use a monochromatic source. Monochromatic means it is a light wave of a single wavelength, and this monochromatic source is used to eliminate a barrier with two slits or openings. And because of diffraction, if the opening dimension of each slit is much smaller than the light wave, then each slit can act as a point source of light. And these two point sources of light are coherent, which means the two waves have a constant phase relationship because they originate from the same light source and they also have the same frequency as the original light source. And this experiment is known as Young's double slit experiment and the pattern of bright and dark parallel bands appear in the viewing screen placed here. And these bands are known as fringes. So the maximum points here form a bright fringe such as this one. And it is the case when the two waves arriving from the slits combine constructively, which means they will arrive in phase. And when the two waves combine destructively, they form minimum points, resulting in dark fringes. And this is the case when the two waves arrive out of phase with each other. And note here that interference does not occur only at the screen, but it occurs everywhere between the two slits and the screen. So the light intensity at a point P on the screen is the result of the superposition of the light coming from the two slits. And the wave traveling from the lower slit will travel a longer distance than from the upper slit to the point P. And the path difference is given by this amount known as delta. And using a simplification model, you can show that delta is equal to d sine theta and is equal to m lambda, where d is the distance between the slits and m is an integer equal to 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on. So the value of this path difference delta will determine whether the two waves leaving the slits will arrive at P in phase or out of phase. So we can write a ratio that converts the path difference into a certain angle or phase difference. So because the path difference between two waves of one whole wavelength corresponds to an angle or phase difference of 2 pi, because as you can see in that case they will arrive in phase, then we can write the ratio delta over phi, where phi is the phase difference is equal to lambda over 2 pi. If the path difference is 0, 1 whole wavelength, 2 whole wavelengths, and so on, then the two waves arriving at P will be in phase and they will interfere constructively, producing a bright fringe. And if the path difference is half a wavelength or one and a half wavelength, and so on, then the two waves arriving at P will be 180 degrees out of phase and they will interfere destructively, producing a dark fringe. And in this case, the path difference is written as m plus half lambda. So interference can be observed in many situations in which a single source of light splits into two coherent light sources and then recombine. And one of these situations is interference in thin films, such as a film of oil on water or in a soap bubble. And this is why color bands appear on the thin film of a soap bubble as a result of interference. So diffraction occurs when waves pass through a small opening or when waves pass around an obstacle or a sharp edge. So diffraction is the spreading or diverging of light from its initial line of travel and the emerging rays will have a path difference between them. And so constructive and destructive interference happens to this diffracted light, forming what is known as a diffraction pattern. And it consists of bright and dark areas with a broad and intense central band known as the central maximum. So we can say that an interference pattern results from two sources interfering with each other. And the diffraction pattern results from a wave interfering with itself after passing through a small opening or around an obstacle or sharp edge. Because as you can see, the emerging rays from the opening will have a path difference between them. This is the path difference and it is in the same way as in the case of the interference. And the path difference between rays 1 and 3 and 3 and 5 is given by this equation where a is the width of the slit and lambda over 2 corresponds to 180 degrees phase difference resulting in destructive interference. And so you can use this analysis to find the positions of maxima and minima in the diffraction pattern which represents the interference pattern between the different parts of the ray itself 
as it passed through an opening. So this figure shows light diffracted from a penny and you can see the bright and dark rings of diffraction pattern and there is also a central maxima or bright spot in the middle. And this phenomena cannot be explained by the ray approximation because in that approximation if a penny is placed along the path of the light rays then the screen will show the dark shadow of the penny without the central bright spot and without the bright and dark rings around it. And this shows how it is essential to fully include the wave nature of light to explain the central bright spot and explain diffraction. The wave nature of light also limits resolution and resolution is the ability of an optical system to distinguish between two closely spaced objects. And because light is diffracted from each object as you can see here then if the two objects are far enough then the central maxima of the two diffraction patterns will not overlap and the two images can be distinguished and are said to be resolved. But if the two objects are closer and the central maxima overlap, then the two images cannot be resolved and cannot be distinguished from each other. And the resolution limit of an optical device is determined by the ratio of the wavelength used to the dimension of the object. So one type of diffraction is the diffraction of X-rays by crystals, and it is used to reveal the inner structure of a crystal. So X-rays have a wavelength of around one angstrom and regular areas of atoms in the crystals have a spacing of about one angstrom and the crystal can be used as a three-dimensional diffraction grating for x-rays resulting in constructive and destructive interference at certain positions that are related to the inner structure of the crystal and the condition for constructive interference points is given by Bragg's law. And note that this wave nature of light can only explain certain phenomena but could not explain some experiments such as the photoelectric effect in which electrons are ejected from a metal when the surface of the metal is exposed to light. And this led to the conclusion that light has a dual nature, so in some cases light acts as a wave, and in others as a stream of particles known as photons. And the particle nature of light is explained by quantum physics. <music>